Hello and welcome back once again. It is time for the Golden Age of DC Comics. 365 days where I take this beloved hardcover coffee table book given to me by one of my best friends about two decades ago. And this has been surfing my coffee table ever since. It is a constant source, a daily source of great comic book conversation that I intend to share with you here today, trying to repli replicate those comic book conversations we used to have in the comic book shop. And so thank you so much for tuning in. The Golden Age of DC Comics runs between 1938 and 1955, an interesting time in human and American history, coming out of the Great Depression, World War II, and entering the space race. Um, and so this uh, is a really interesting lens of pop culture and magazine publication of that slice of history. This is a an Abrams 2004 publication. You can find a link to Amazon in the description if you want your own copy. Uh, it's pretty affordable, $8 used last time I checked, and up to about $25 brand new. It'll look great on your coffee table, and I know it makes a great gift. Trust me, the intended purpose uh, of this book I'm, I'm trying to do, we're going to open up to today's date. We're going to look at some art, we're going to read the blurb, and then we're going to talk about comic books. And we're going to talk about comic books every day for the rest of the year. This is also where I put in my escapism caveat. Uh, activism is a very important thing and it is needed in the world, especially with all the modern problems we have. Yet activism is also kind of a bully. Um, it's a kind of needy and when it doesn't get its way, it uses dirty tricks. I'm saying this from a very benign place. Um, I am for escapism because this is a really hard world for us and we need our escapisms to give us a respite from this world's problems uh, just for a few minutes in a day. You know, the problems will be there when we get back um, and it, activism truly has its place. But for activism to try to subvert our stories solely to be a platform for their message is just kind of it, it's you know keep it to the protests and your spaces stop invading our spaces we need our escapism we need to be a pirate or a space hero or a superhero fight some aliens or some you know or or, or some orcs or, or or with the elves and the dwarves as the ranger of the forest or imagine we're someone we're really not and, and live an emotional experience. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot to escapism. And uh, so please, d don't tread on our escapism. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you for tuning in. Thank you. And we're going to open this book up to today's date. It is June the 26th. And this is Story by Edmund Hamilton. Pencils by Wayne Boring. Inks by Stan K. This is from Superman 106 from July of 1956, right before the end of the Silver, I mean the Golden Age. The, the Silver Age begins the following month in October of 1956. And uh, or, or, this is August? No, this is July. Three months later, in uh, October, uh, I believe it's October, September or October of 56, is when Showcase number four is released. And that is the official start of the Silver Age. So this is from the very end of the Golden Age. And uh, this is Baby Cal L in his Kryptonian life pod um, as a baby and on his way to Earth after, you know, after his parents saved him from the destruction of Krypton. And this boy will be adopted by a very uh, nice couple who had no children on a farm in Smallville, Kansas. They'll give him the name Clark. Jonathan and Martha Kent do that. And we all know Clark Kent as Superman. This is a, it's a, it's a he's an immigrant and he was a vulnerable person, uh, you know, and he was given kindness and compassion. And it's a, there's really a lot to unpack in the story of Superman. I'm, I'm so happy, I'm happy, I'm so happy to be tuned into his story. Let's read the blurb. DC told the story of Superman's origin over and over again as the years went by. We'll get to my favorite. 
always with a new variation or new with new variations. In this version, the child who is rocketing from Krepton to Earth is older and more articulate than the infant shown in the very first panels from 1938. And for the first time, he seems to be enjoying his trip through space. The writer, a big name in science fiction pulp magazines, was one of several who turned to comics as the pulps gave up the ghost. Yeah, and that was about time when I think television started supplanting the pulp magazines to tell, you know, their stories and their procedurals. And, um, but yeah, so let's look at baby kal -El. Once again, sometimes seen as a, a newborn and sometimes seen as a toddler. Uh, my favorite reinterpretation was when I was 14 years old in 1987. Um, I was 13 going on 14. And there was a really awesome post-crisis. Um, we're now in the Copper Age. And uh, it was called World of Krypton 1987. Numbers 1 through 4. Story by John Byrne with magnificent art by Mike Mignola, who would go on to do Hellboy. He would find lots of success there. Um, and he also drew one of my all-time favorite DC Universe stories called Cosmic Odyssey. Um, and it was very heartbreaking because that's where Jon Stewart made a mistake and lost the entire planet of Zanshi. That, and that's some guilt that that character, one of my favorite Green Lanterns, carried around with him for decades. It was really good pathos. It was really good storytelling. And um, World of Krypton, though, had the history of Krypton from issue one, where it was ancient times, uh, up to issue four, right before the destruction of Krypton. And there was just some really great world building. It, sh it showed a brand new uh, vision of Krypton, a brand new um, vision of Jor-El and Lara. Um, it showed a brand new vision of like their, their, their dress. Before that, there was a green tunic with a yellow sun and a red headband. That was Jor-El's, you know, classic look and going from the Golden Age. And this Copper Age version showed sleek black outfits, um, almost androgynous, too. So by the time we get to the future, of the end of Krypton, um, it's, it's really remarkable because I feel sometimes it's the prescient power of science fiction that these people, these Kryptonians, lived in, in, in condos and in skyscrapers and very urban environments, out of touch with nature and each other. They had um, non-delusional parasocial relationships through Zooms. Uh, Kara, I mean, uh, Jor-El only meets Lara at the very end. They had never met in real life. They were uh, genetically uh, sequenced as a good match, and therefore um, their their infant, Kal-El, was still in a birthing matrix in another location. Jor-El steals this birthing matrix, meets his wife, you know, and in real life, and you know, he's not, the same story, he's not believed that, like, I have information of where the world is dying, it's going to explode. Oh, jor -El, you're full of space baloney, you know. Um, I really do, like, I, so the whole birthing matrix thing, it's like, I, I prefer a bit more of the, um, of natural love involved in that, because all these Kryptonians by this time in this version of the story, were the product of, of just gene banks and um, in vitro, you know, non-traditional birthing techniques. They were n not necessarily clones because clones were used in the beginning of the, of the of of the story, and it was so interesting because clones were being used uh, for, for for organ harvesting and. Um, and there was this one disturbing story note, too, where a mother was uh, unable, you know, felt so sorry for her son who was unable to get a mate that she uh, opened up one of her clones and lied to him and um, told him that you know, that was the love of his life. And, that, you know, to it, this guy had a psychotic break, you know, unfair representations of mental health and 
pop culture fictions and comic books especially all aside but that's it was it made interesting story and it made interesting tension and uh yeah so if you can check out house of krypton i mean the world of krypton 1987 by john byrne and mike mcnola and uh that tale itself has been retold a few different times since uh jarell's got some brand new duds a few yeah <laughs> you know over time and uh, but yeah that's about all we have for the for today. We've been talking about the golden age at DC Comics, 365 days, and we're going to talk about comic books every day for the rest of the year. So tune in tomorrow, 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern, and we'll find out who we're talking about when we turn the page tomorrow. Please like and subscribe. Turn on those notifications. I make daily content. We talk about comic books every day. I'm an ordained minister and or uh, an amateur theologian. I say hashtag lighten up. It's about enlightenment and how spirituality can help improve your daily existence. I'm a professional chef. I have check out my uh, my playlist. What's cooking? I share with you cooking hacks. Apparently, my soups are really good, and I want to share that with you. So thank you so much for tuning in today. God bless. Namaste. Good luck, and we will see you in the funny pages tomorrow. Cheers. Bye-bye.